Welcome and hello everyone. My name is Ivy Love. I'm a policy analyst with the Center on Education and Skills here at New America. And I first just wanna thank you all for being here with us today. We're really grateful to have you here for this discussion on how best to support our students and institutions, uh, particularly in the healthcare programs um, in this really strange and difficult time that we're living through. So just a couple of things before we get started. Uh, as Narmada just mentioned, if you have a question at any point over the course of the webinar, please feel free to submit that along with your affiliation using the chat function of Zoom. Our events team will collect your questions and then my colleague Iris Palmer will moderate a discussion of as many questions as we can get to during the last portion of the webinar. I do wanna let you all know that we will be making this webinar recording available as well as the slide deck after the webinar has concluded. That will be located on the event page uh, for this webinar on New America's website. And then finally, I wanna invite all of you to share your thoughts and to connect with us and with each other on Twitter during and after the webinar. We'll be using the hashtag CCOnline that you can see there down in the footer of the slides. We have a great lineup of panelists today for you. And many of our presenters were connected in some way to a large federal investment in community colleges that was made in response to the Great Recession around a decade ago. As you can see, we'll be covering three TACT grants. That's CHEO, H2P, and Mo Health Wins, and hear more about what they learned from their experiences that can inform our practice in community college healthcare programs today. We're also very fortunate to have Donna Meyer from the Organization for Associate Degree Nursing who can share a bit about what ODIN is doing for their members and for community college nursing programs across the country. Before we move into our presentations, I do just want to share a bit about that recession era federal investment in community colleges that I mentioned, the TACT program, which our team has been researching at New America for the last couple of years, particularly how it highlighted the potential of community colleges to form part of recovery efforts and what that may mean for us right now. So as the economy worsened in the Great Recession, many people turned to community colleges to get the training that they needed to either get a different job, get a better job, or get some more security in their current work. So TACT funded single community colleges and consortia of community colleges, like the three that we'll be highlighting today, to do a number of things, ranging from building new programs, redesigning existing programs, enhancing student services, and creating openly licensed curricula, in addition to some other options. With such a large investment of nearly $2 billion, there was this looming question after TACT concluded uh, whether or not it achieved its aims of helping folks complete programs and move into the workforce. And we found that it did. Thanks to some generous support from Lumina Foundation, we and our partners at Bragg and Associates were able to conduct a meta-analysis, a causal study looking at the impact of TACT. We found that folks who participated in TACT programs were around twice as likely to complete those programs and around 30% more likely to either get a job or a wage gain after completing their program. We also conducted some qualitative analysis looking at two common implementation strategies that colleges use to support students, um, including prior learning assessment, how that was expanded and enhanced in an effort to accelerate students' progress through their programs, uh, and navigators, uh, a role that was common among TACT grantees that stemmed from coaching them through their programs and in their transition to the workforce and providing holistic support to them. So we've connected folks who worked in TACT and work in community college settings and around community college settings for this webinar today because we feel that while this current situation is different in many ways from the Great Recession, community colleges today are still uh, an important part of the recovery effort in keeping our healthcare workforce strong and in keeping communities strong in this really trying time. So what folks learned then we feel uh, can help inform our practice right now. And that's really what we wanna share with you all today. So I'm going to hand it over to our presenters now who will just share a bit about 
what helped them build and sustain strong healthcare programs, um, many of whom did not uh, connect all the time with students face to face in their tact work and what that may mean for us now. So with that, I want to pass it on to our first presenters for the day, uh, Heather McKay and Maria Feet. Thank you, Ivy, I appreciate it. You can advance the slide. This is Maria Fees, and um, I um, stood as the project director for this um, particular project. The CHEOS project was designed to increase access to sustainable healthcare programming that would build the workforce um, pipeline. And we built programs in nursing, EMS, radiology, uh, med tech, and, and some others. It was a round two uh, tax initiative out of uh, Pueblo Community College in Colorado. We partnered with several other um, Colorado colleges as well as um, colleges in Wyoming, South Dakota, Montana, and Alaska. So broad span and these are um, very uh, remote states in many ways. We also part partnered with WICHE, the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Ed, and the Colorado Community uh, College System, they, who provided this nice uh, backdrop of support, as did the Rutgers evaluation team, whom you'll hear from in a few minutes. Um, Skills Commons, Creative Commons, Transformative Change Initiative, thanks Deb, and CAS team. Tons of partnerships outside of those as well. It takes a lot of folks to make something like this um, come off well. Each college had its own team, which included a project lead, and those folks saw the, the effort at their local level. They also had instructional designers, career coaches, data specialists, and fiscal and grant management support. And each of those subgroups across the consortium met online monthly to problem solve and to celebrate. So we had to do a lot of work around strong communication, um, being able to um, um, effectively um, work together online. And so tons of learning for all of us during that time, but it's come in handy now that we're in this scenario that we're in. These project teams created 21 um, new revised program. We served around 6,000 unique participants, exceeded wage target by almost 200%, and built six articulation agreements, which um, um, led to better options for students, for sure, but maybe more importantly, opened the doors for further partnering. Um, in order to better engage students in their own learning who were living in these remote states, we used innovative approaches like web-based labs, uh, somewhat of an anomaly um, and a breakthrough in some ways for the world of science instruction, and, and Heather's going to share more about that in just a moment. Schools also incorporated uh, mobile ambulance labs, which were fully stocked ambulances that went to students' home areas, and that allowed um, commute time to be cut back significantly for students. Um, instructional designers introduced and supported methodology like flipped classrooms and incorporating um, open educational resources, OER. And for many faculty at that time, it was that was just a completely um, foreign idea of uh, adopting large scale free or reduced um, priced curriculum. So um, there was a lot of work to do around just helping people understand what did it look like. We uh, worked closely with our third party, which was the Rutgers team led by Heather McKay. And um, we did that to better understand the impacts of, of what was happening with those innovations and strategy, strategies. I'm going to turn it over to Heather and she's going to talk a little bit more about how we deployed those strategies. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, I think it's a really great opportunity to be able to talk about CHEO in the context of what's happening today uh, with the COVID crisis and, um, and the new reality that we're all in uh, sitting at home listening to this webinar and, and working from home. Uh, and our students are all learning from home and, and CHEO provides a really nice example of how technology can be used as a tool for learning and teaching in healthcare. Um, the CHEO grant, as Maria talked about, was a way to help develop capacity for rural colleges. And many of these colleges were very rural. There were uh, colleges in Alaska. One of them was an, on an island in Kodiak. Um, colleges in Montana and Colorado. Um, and, and these schools uh, were in places where students came from many, many different um, 
surrounding towns and many, many miles away. Uh, and in some cases, as in the case uh, of the college in Alaska, students were all over the country uh, because they were participating in um, uh, training there, but also um, a part of the military. So they would be connecting from, from lots of different places. So I think the, the way that CHEO was set up is a nice example for us to think about and how to teach science and healthcare classes remotely. The grant used a variety of different kinds of innovations like that Maria talked about, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more closely about some of those. Um, and during CHEO, making these changes was for some colleges uh, difficult to do, as Maria talked about. There was pushback from faculty in some cases, um, and uh, it was a change from business as usual, which was for some hard to swallow and, and hard to understand how learning could happen in a different way, in an online setting or in a remote setting. Uh, but now none of us have a, has a choice, right? Uh, we're all doing this and, and we have to be doing this for some time, at least for the rest of the semester probably, and, and maybe um, at some point into the fall or next spring, this could happen again. So I think it's a time to think about innovating and it, it's a time for those who might have been resistance at, resistant at one time to begin to think about how they can do this and how they can make this delivery work for them and how they can help their students to learn. Uh, so I think CHEO provides some really good examples. I'm gonna talk about a few of those now. Um, one was the online science labs that Maria talked about. These online science labs were a network of remote science labs. Uh, the acronym for this group was called NANSLO. Uh, there was a lab in uh, Canada, there was one in Colorado, and there was one in Montana. The uh, two of these labs still exist, the one in Montana and the one in, in um, Canada still exist. And these labs provided remote experiences for students. Students could conduct experiments from a computer by manipulating robotics equipment, in a remote lab. They could see what was happening on their computer screen, see the robot moving different things, see the robot um, doing different chemistry experiments, physics ex experiments, etc. Students were accompanied by a lab technician uh, online during those experiments who could help them with the experiment, could fix equipment if it needed to be fixed, and could help them think through the learning outcomes as they went along to make sure that they were getting what they needed out of the lab. Uh, during CHEO, there was some resistance to this idea. Uh, many thought that labs really couldn't be done remotely or they couldn't be done as well remotely. Um, others wondered, why would we do this when, when we've got labs on campus? What's, what's the point of this? So in some ways, um, NANSL was before its time, but I think it was really unique. Uh, and it's, it's a tool that could be incredibly useful in today's atmosphere. Uh, we did a study on NANSLO and, and uh, that's available on Skills Commons like Maria talked about and I think there'll be a link at the end of the webinar to get to that. But what we found was that there was no difference in the learning outcomes um, between the NANSLO lab results and other home lab uh, options like mail kits. Um, so students were really learning from NANSLO. We also heard from students. We talked to a lot of students who did these remote labs and they loved them. They thought it was a really fabulous experience. They felt like they learned a lot. Um, and so it was a good way to continue to do hands-on learning uh, in science in a remote way. And so I, I think NANSLO presents a really great uh, story and opportunity. Uh, another um, mobile option uh, that was used during CHEO was this idea of a mobile learning lab. And this was also used in, in all three of the tax grants in Colorado. So it was used in healthcare for CHEO, but it was also used in the later grant um, uh, CHAMP for manufacturing. And these labs were really um, mobile classrooms. They were ways for students to experience hands-on learning in healthcare uh, uh, in, in a remote setting. And, and one could imagine that these kinds of classrooms or labs um, could be really useful tools in the COVID crisis. You could set up a remote classroom to help retrain health workers to do testing for COVID, um, to conduct those drive-through tests that we see everywhere, to train healthcare workers to, to do different kinds of COVID treatments when space is busy in hospitals and clinics and, and there's just not space for workforce training available. Um, or, you know, going to rural areas or going to, uh, to, to areas where there might be folks trained in home health care that, that could be useful in the COVID crisis and thinking about retraining. So the mobile lab idea, I think, has some legs here and could be very useful moving forward. Uh, another thing that Maria mentioned were these new technologies and techniques. And I think uh, many of you who might be out there teaching now are learning these things as you go and moving forward. But the, the folks in the CHEO project um, have some really nice lessons learned about the kinds of things that they learned how to do during CHEO in terms of teaching healthcare and science online and how they um, use different technologies and tools. Um, so uh, folks did broadcasting of, of different um, lectures and they made them interactive. People also used um, robots and other ways to, to demonstrate um, different techniques and teach them remotely. Um, 
the four students and, and really work to engage students. So I think a lot of the lessons from CHEO there can be really helpful. Another thing that I think CHEO did really well was the employer partnerships. And that will resonate really well now, I think, too. Um, working closely with, with employers, CHEO created some really successful um, partnerships. They created a sector partnership in Colorado, and they worked with educators and employers around the table, creating a dialogue about what CHEO could do and how the colleges could respond to the needs of the community. And once again, that's going to be a really important uh, thing to think about during the COVID crisis. Colleges need to make sure that they're training people that are needed in the field, that they're creating coursework that responds to the changing needs of the pandemic and fill in the workforce gaps. And by working with employers, colleges can plan and serve their communities in an effective way. Uh, finally, stackable credentials was, a, was another theme in, in CHEO that I think resonates very well today and, and is really important. Um, creating educational and healthcare pack, uh, pathways is uh, an important thing for students always, um, but it's particularly important when we need to get people out in the field in healthcare quickly. Uh, so colleges in CHEO thought about how credentials could be stacked and latticed. Um, that also occurred in, in the later tech grants in Colorado, uh, where work was done on credit for prior learning and creating a better credit for prior learning process and policy. Um, and one could imagine during this crisis that there might be ways to begin to train people quickly in, in uh, areas needed for COVID, like the testing, creating uh, short-term certificates that could be stacked uh, and latticed later into, into other credentials uh, or degrees. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity here to think about how stackable credentials could be helpful um, for students and, and allow them to move forward and use any training that they're getting now to respond to the pandemic later. Um, it's also possibly a good way to get students out into the workforce quickly uh, if that's needed. So something to think about there. Finally, um, uh, the CHEO grant used career coaching and navigation as a tool. This was really important under the CHEO grant, and they did a lot of this work remotely. So coaches would work with these rural students uh, and help them through their education and career pathways in a remote manner. And students need the same from us all now, right? They're facing financial struggles. They're learning to go to school online, maybe for the first time. They're trying to make decisions about their own educational and career pathways in light of a very, very different world. Um, advising is gonna be essential for these students and, and figuring out how to do that remotely is gonna be really important. And I think CHEO has some good lessons for us there. Uh, next slide, Ivy. So um, I think one of the things to think about here is that uh, while crises are uh, hard, <laughs> they're difficult to go through, they're difficult to slog through, and it's, it, it's challenging to see um, the effects of this pandemic and, and of the recession uh, on our communities. Uh, moments like this and, and moments like the TACT grant in the 2008 recession can serve as an opportunity to make change happen. And um, and to, to make change sustainable. So I implore you all to, to use this as an opportunity where possible to think about making um, change and making technology at the forefront of that change. Um, pursuing this institutional change will certainly help students now and in the future. Um, but I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from TACT about how to scale and how to sustain change. Um, so I would, I would recommend that folks look at these tech grants and, and consider how sustainability um, can be something that, that is a goal for you now as you begin to develop these changes and innovations, both this semester and in the future um, as, as you respond to the COVID crisis. Um, healthcare and science education can be taught online is another finding from CHEO. Um, we saw even the biggest of skeptics um, get convinced that students can learn well online and students can do um, some hands-on learning remotely. Um, CHEO has some nice examples of how that happened. And, and again, I think uh, our evaluation reports and, and the work that um, Maria did and, and others in the grant can be great resources to you as you move forward with this. Um, and finally, moving, using strategies to move um, students through career pathways is something that, that CHEO did really well and, and I think could be very helpful as we all think about moving forward, training students quickly, creating these pathways, and, and also figuring out ways to keep students enrolled, keep them engaged in higher education are gonna be really important. So flexibility is crucial. These are really difficult times. We need to think about ways to help students get through them. Uh, credit for prior learning policies are one way to do that, as are reforms in developmental education for healthcare pathways, um, and developing and, and promoting and advising students through educational and career pathways. So I'll move on to you, Maria. Thanks, Heather, and she's right. Science and other disciplinaries can be taught online successfully, and we learned that through um, um, 
some trial and error for sure, but there are definite successes that can happen pretty quickly. It takes a lot of support for faculty and for senior staff. And we used project management tools to make sure that those stakeholders stayed informed. But more importantly, I think um, in the instructional designers who were incredibly talented, by the way, were key in uh, providing this ground level support system for instructors. And they, in, at, in some cases, would hand walk instructors through how to do these new kinds of methods and techniques and help them redesign um, their delivery of instruction methodology. They learned how to flip classes along with a number of other things and all intended to increase student engagement and provide better access. Those practices led to um, increased confidence levels of uh, students, but also increased confidence levels in instructors and ownership of, these, of this new way of thinking about teaching, which gave colleges an upskilled faculty pool. We also learned that program acceleration was really key to boosting that um, healthcare workforce pipeline. And I think that's a consistent lesson that we saw across tech projects, regardless of the sector. We, ha we know people have to get in the workplace and um, in order to better support themselves and their families. And these programs were all designed to do exactly that. Um, as Heather emphasized a few minutes ago, employer partnerships are more important now than they ever have been and with the help of the Colorado Workforce Development Council we've launched um, a healthcare sector partnership in Colorado the first of its kind in southern Colorado and um, this group continues to meet uh, and and their their main objective is to identify and then help meet the needs of employers in the area. So if your region or your institution hasn't tapped into the benefits of supporting uh, any sector partnership work, you might consider taking a look at that. You can learn more about that at nextgenerationsectorpartnerships.com or you can reach out to me directly and I can point you in that direction and we'll get you my um, contact information here in just a bit. Okay, next slide. Thank you, Ivy. I appreciate that. Um, lastly, we've got a little goodie bag for you. Uh, when Chia was nearing its close, I went to work with the Skills Common team to support the next TAC project. And for those not aware of uh, Skills Commons, it was built out of materials developed by the TAC colleges, all 700 of them. And it's now considered to be the world's largest repository of free Yep, free and open workforce development and training materials. You don't need an account, you don't need a login, you don't need a password, you can go in and download whatever it is you like and change it how you want. It's hosted out of Cal State University and um, it holds complete courses, simulations, which as you know, are very cool approaches to teaching hands-on in healthcare. It's one of the most effective ways of doing that. Assessments, supplementals, support for career coaches, recruitment, and lots, lots more. Uh, there are about 200,000 downloads that are occurring each quarter. So that tells us that users really are continuing to find that material relevant and useful. Um, so Skills Commons and its sister project Merlot, which is a ginormous clearinghouse of academic oriented uh, courses and materials. A lot of those are open and free as well. And they've built a timely response to COVID-19. They've provided this free collection of resources, including tips and tricks, for those who may be new to online teaching and learning, full courses in hygiene, safety, infectious materials, et cetera. And all these courses were built by institutions out of Colorado, Georgia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, California, the H2 project that you're gonna hear about in a few minutes and, and lots of others. The Skills Commons and Merlot team is offering to build your organization a similar COVID site for free. And they, it's just the idea that how are we going to better support each other uh, during this time? And this is something that um, Skills Commons and Merlot are, are offering for folks. You can access more information about CHEO and all the other projects that you're going to hear today, um, including the evaluation reports and links to the OER collections in the Skills Commons project showcase. And as I understand it, I was going to share um, a link to that a little bit later. All of the material is free to download, change it as you wish, wrap it with your institution's brand and put, um, put it to work more quickly than it, it would if you were starting from scratch, more quickly and more cost effectively. 
critical now as it, as it has ever been. My contact information is going to be included on the speaker slide. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to assist. Um, with that, Ivy, I will hand it back to you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Heather and Maria. I uh, would love to pass it on to our next presenters, uh, Marianne Krismer and Deb Bragg. Thank you, Ivy. Um, I'm Deb Bragg. I was the third party evaluator and led a team that, that I work with then at the Office of Community College Research and Leadership at the University of Illinois, where I also co-directed the Transformative Change Initiative that Maria uh, referred to, our, to. It's another site where you can get a lot of materials. Um, go ahead and change the slide, Ivy. Um, I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity today to present some information about the H2P Consortium with my good colleague, Marianne Krismer, who was the director of the consortium. H2P uh, was in the first round of TAC and involved nine community and technical colleges across five states, as you see there. These colleges range from um, uh, quite small, uh, an example, Ashland Community and Technical College in Ashland, Kentucky, uh, to Malcolm X College here where I live in the city of Chicago, uh, part of the large city colleges of Chicago system. Um, and everything in between. Um, the colleges all came together partly because they had already begun to re-envision what healthcare could look like. And they all had invested in some innovations that they wanted to share with one another, but also grow a national network as well as a national movement and when this group of people came together, which they often did at least once a year during the four years of the grant, there was a lot of conversation about how they could really ignite transformative change in the healthcare education environment in community and technical colleges nationwide. And that vision has really materialized because of their efforts. And Marianne will tell you a lot about that. Um, Looking at fundamentally what this consortium was about, one of the most important features was the belief that there is a core set of competencies that anyone working in the healthcare industry needs to know. And they work very hard together to identify that set of competencies that is then foundational to all healthcare education that's taught at, at these colleges and colleges that adopt. So what I'm telling you is there's a core set of competencies that is a certified nursing assistant would learn as well as a registered nurse, but also someone who's a rad tech or respiratory therapist or an EMT or a paramedic. These core sets of competencies would in themselves create an industry recognized credential that's fundamental. And I can't imagine that there is a more important um, innovation that could serve us right now in COVID-19 than knowing that these individuals have been trained with this core set of competencies. So um, that I think is really important. I don't know if any of you were on the webinar yesterday, but Jan Pomeroy, who's with the Anoka Ramsey Community College in Minnesota, was one of our speakers, and she talked about the holistic support strategy that was fundamental to the H2P Consortium. So I'd urge you, given time, to, to list, to grab that webinar from yesterday from the New America website and hear what Jan and others had to say. Um, I'd also point out the partnerships are absolutely fundamental, and I know Mar uh, Marianne's going to talk about them. Um, in total, this consortium served about 6,500 students through various strategies, 
5,000 of those students enrolled in, in uh, 48 programs of study in healthcare, and almost 70% of those students earned a credential. Um, and the results were, uh, did demonstrate a positive impact of these students and their educational outcomes and compared to a match comparison. So there's strong impact data to support this work as well. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my good colleague, Marianne. Well, welcome everyone. It's, it is so exciting for an extrovert such as me to be in a room with 120 or 134 virtual people. So I'm, I'm just envisioning all of you and all of us working together and work that is important to us all. Um, Already, um, as Maria and Heather and also certainly Deb has, has, has addressed, is that the work of the TAC grants really was um, very, very visionary and supportive of just the type of work that we need to be doing here. And many of us are doing. It's just a matter of you know picking it up and picking up some best practices and moving on to be able to provide the best possible <laughs> Um, educational pathway for our students into the much needed healthcare careers. In reflecting, um, my role prior to being consortium director is I was a dean of health and public safety of a very large um, health program. We had over 4,000 students. And now subsequently I'm working um, actually as a consultant with the state of Ohio that is working on healthcare pathways and partnerships with our um, local and, and statewide um, healthcare workforce to identify pathways to get high school students through to college and into careers. Um, so it, it continues to where I continue to pull upon these strategies. One of the um, particular the reasons that we came together and Deb alluded to the fact it was really a very, very dynamic group of individuals. Each of us had different strengths. And the strength of El Central Community College out of Dallas was that they had been working over 15 years on a core curriculum for healthcare and had actually implemented it for all of their programs, including nursing. And so we basically used this as our benchmark template and, and grew it to a actual healthcare core curriculum that was crosswalked and validated with the national science curriculum, that's the high school uh, curriculum, and also with the um, curriculum or, or with the, the uh, basic healthcare competencies model that was developed by the Department of Labor. And actually, our group then worked with that particular group and HRSA and also the um, Health Professions Network to update it in 2015. So we have now a curriculum. And what is interesting about that, it's all, it's all available, it's free. There are seven modules. We hired a company to put together great video, great content, all ready to download, all, all available to you on um, Skills Commons. But in addition to that, um, that particular work is now being offered um, through the um, Minnesota system and the um, Health Force Minnesota. Uh, um, and um, that is available as a curriculum that kind of a train the trainer curriculum that can be offered um, to your staff or to people within your community. And this content can be provided in a variety of ways from high school to college to within the healthcare um, environment itself, to community-based. And we're doing that in the greater Cincinnati area. And also I know that they're doing that in Minnesota um, to actually bring healthcare uh, workforce together to be responsible to some extent for the pathway into the teaching, the learning, the instructing by providing this very, very strong foundation. Along with that, another um, course that was developed with funds um, and it came out of Cincinnati. We had a very, very innovative biology faculty member who put together, listened to what we were saying about healthcare and put together a course um, called Integrated Biology and Skills for Success in Science. 
It's actually a six hour pre-course um, that can be offered as a pre-anatomy uh, and physiology pre-program course, or it can be even offered in high school or as a boot camp. And this course, which was piloted during this period of 2011 to 2015, actually now has been utilized by literally thousands of students with extremely positive outcome and success in those barrier courses, such as anatomy and physiology. So um, basically, when we looked at the strategies, and there were eight strategies we looked at, it was very holistic. And everything that has been said prior, we integrated into our strategies. Um, but what is important to create a system or systematic change that is impactful is that really not one particular strategy, whether it be distance learning or core curriculum or partnerships or student support can survive on its own. It's very important that the system be thought of as a system, an integrated system that involves all stakeholders. It starts at the local level, regional level, state level, and goes all the way to the national level. And in our grant, we did just that. For example, we had all had our workforce investment boards working directly with us and our employers working directly with us. Also, most of us had community-based agencies working with us, as well as, of course, the community college and the system, school systems within that particular region. We also connected with the National Alliance of Business, which is the group that actually um, coordinates and provides resources for 1,200 local boards around the country. So we were able to get before them, to meet with them, and have them help us with some of our strategies. This in addition with many other national organizations that we continue to work with, such as NN2 and HPN and other healthcare organizations, as well as our accrediting groups. So it is important, you know, although the work really does have to begin at the local level, that there are those national connections to be able to help you navigate through this. Um, and I, I would say that when it comes to recruitment, um, and uh, we have to really always be cognizant in our communities as to what we need to do. Clearly, um, when we came together, we were in a national crisis. It was just coming out of a great recession. We had many of our skilled workers who had lost their jobs due to overseas um, employment um, or changing uh, the jobs to overseas. And that was starting to mitigate, but we still had a situation when the workforce was trying to recover. And at the same time, healthcare jobs were in great need. We're not that different now than we were then. And we have the same challenges. So we're going to have to get well-trained healthcare workers into the workforce that also keep in mind, we want equity and diversity needs being met. And we don't want to lose sight of this, especially now. Um, with that in mind, what we did with the grant that I felt really helped, and as I said, Dallas was the kingpin, so to say, with the core curriculum. In the case of Cincinnati, we had a very, very robust collaborative that was, uh, had been established in 2003 and continues to work effectively in our community called the Greater Cincinnati Health Careers Collaborative. That is now even expanded throughout Northern Kentucky and Southeastern Indiana. And we do work at, all over the state actually now. The key is, is that this was an employer-led partnership with education and the um, community also being very much center stage. So we work collaboratively, leave our egos at the door and really work to meet the workforce needs and the diversity needs improving poverty in the region collectively under our United Way, which hosted um, the, the group, which was funded um, by various funding methods. So um, this particular group became very helpful and we established different um, types of similar collaboratives in Louisville that continues to work and in, also in Dallas. 
Um, Chicago had uh, some, has used some of the um, techniques in the um, in our 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 learning and developing there. So, and Minnesota also. So we were able to then get greater engagement between the workforce investment boards, employers, and the community colleges to make sure we were meeting those particular needs. This continues to be extremely important now, and we have many, many um, positive um, examples to demonstrate from this, including right now we're working on an apprenticeship program. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Hello, next slide, okay, very good. Um, so that we have actually created um, various types of pathways that reduce time to completion. We've reached out to employer community partner networks that are there. Some of, some of these um, actual training are within our community partner agency. Some are actually on site with employers and um, many of them are embedded in high schools and in the community colleges. But the concept is it's pathway work that is, it, it ensures employability. So in reducing the time to completion, in providing opportunity and making sure that our students have the critical skills that they need to be successful in healthcare, we're actually pushing this down whenever possible into the high school or early into the community college experience, getting students employed as quickly as possible, developing internships, apprenticeships, and really right now what's huge in our area is the pre-apprenticeships for all the high school students. So they graduate with a viable high school credential that is a healthcare apprenticeship and direct entry into healthcare programs with credit being also earned. So it decreases that time to completion. They have a job. Um, it really has been supportive of our more at promise students that earlier would have dropped out early because they didn't have the skill set or the um, necessary income they needed to mitigate their particular challenges. So it's really showing or demonstrating some success and we continue to work on those particular uh, pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs, especially in um, medical assisting, sterile processing, um, looking into ones for respiratory care and nursing. Um, so this continues, again, a lot of barriers. We still, we have a lot of uh, things to do, but we're making some progress. Um, always in every single case, and Deb was super, super helpful with this, is we use data to improve. We do use data to move forward and to make our case. And this is extremely important when we're working with workforce investment boards and with our employers. So I guess in closing for me, as I would say, um, right now, act now while the, the iron's hot. I mean, you've got reasons to implement some of those innovations and to get your community partners mobilized. Do it now while the iron's hot. And sometimes you're gonna make some mistakes. We can mitigate those in the future, but the, the, the um, innovation and the opportunity often occurs when there is the most challenge. Deb, did you have something else you wanted to say? I think we... I didn't, Mary Ann. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both. Really appreciate it. Um, I would like to pass it on now to our folks from Mo Health Winds. I apologize for my dog backing, barking in the background. Um, John and Maggie Cosgrove and Kenny Wilson. Thank you so much. This, um, this is Maggie Cosgrove, and uh, John and I served as the researchers on Mo Health Wins, and that was such a humbling experience uh, to work with such passionate educators, and it, it really still resonates. So thank you for including us in this uh, webinar. Uh, it's, it's important to colleges as they work frontline in this COVID period. So first, I just have to say that um, our research really echoes the information of each of the previous speakers. Um, having said that, John and I have identified four overarching themes from our research that we believe are applicable as colleges respond to the COVID-19 
crisis in new and innovative ways. So um, as you can see from this slide, MoHealth Wins was a round one tech grant and it included all of the two-year colleges in Missouri. The second bullet point sort of shows that it was a complex endeavor. There were a ton of strategies or innovations. And it, uh, the slide also shows that um, we saw success with both completion and employment, as well as many other areas. But one key lesson that the colleges learned was that student support innovations should be connected to or integrated into the classroom experience. Supports that seemed extra or required students to take some action to get the service were just less likely to be used. Second, we, we know that although the faculty member is the point of the spear for innovation to work, it requires more than just the faculty. Colleges came to learn that each innovation supported the other innovations. And since these innovations overlapped, colleges needed to make sure that organizational functions interacted and overlapped too. For example, financial aid and advising. That showed up time and time again, the importance of that. Um, third, we saw that successful innovative instruction required a team of faculty and staff who were passionate about the innovation, committed to students, and <laughs> flexible. For example, colleges learned that to get adjunct instructors competent in technology, they had to work together and become a team with their IT department to ensure access for remote learners. And finally, because MoHealth Wins was complex, colleges learned the importance of keeping track of what they were doing and what they were learning. For example, the importance of a process to systematically gather feedback from instructors was really helpful. So as colleges develop strategies to address COVID-19, uh, MoHealth provides all of them with a set of successful evidence-based innovations connected to adult and high-risk student populations. Uh, MoHealth was groundbreaking, and so it transformed how Missouri and its community colleges use employer engagement, stackable credentials, accelerated learning, proactive student supports, and technology enhancements to create post-secondary education programs and awards. So having said all that, I now get to turn it over to Kenny Wilson, who has been a leader in his college and across the state in both implementing and learning from these. Thanks, Maggie. And, and you read that, what I, what I said about myself very well. I appreciate that. Um, just kidding. Um, we had the opportunity to work across community colleges and across areas in our state, uh, building bridges in areas that honestly weren't there before. Um, Missouri is a decentralized system. We have our own little fiefdoms in each part of the state that um, you know, build, a, build their programs within a silo. Um, MoHealth Wins really gave us the opportunity to look across these programs to be able to see where we had uh, similarities where we had areas of collaboration and be able to build on those. For us uh, at Jefferson College, which is a small community college about 45 minutes south of St. Louis, uh, we were able to bring on board some programs, some technologies, some activities that honestly we would not have had the opportunity to, to do. Um, as everyone knows, in challenging financial times, um, having the financial flexibility to be able to take risks um, becomes even more challenging. So um, TACT really gave us the opportunity to take some risks that have really paid dividends for us uh, in the long run. So um, technology enhanced content, uh, we'll get into that a little bit more late, later, but technology was a key avenue to be able to connect us to students, connect us to areas that we didn't necessarily um, connect before. 
Um, enhanced advising, navigation is a great word that, we, uh, that we'll talk about a little bit uh, on the next slide, but being able to navigate students through the rough waters of onboarding is, uh, is really challenging. Um, you know, um, employer engagement, uh, employers were involved uh, through uh, multiple avenues through both program development, uh, student uh, core competency development, um, obviously giving clinical opportunities as well as hiring our students afterwards. And then almost as importantly for us to be able to provide us the feedback afterwards to be able to tell us what was good, uh, what needed to be changed, and uh, what, what we could have improved on. The uh, course contextualization is, um, is an interesting concept. We um, had our two programs in MoHealth Wins were a development of a rad tech program that was uh, chunked and modularized, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the other was a CIS program that was specifically dedicated to developing IT representatives within the healthcare field. Um, not so much the HIT realm, but more along the, uh, the physical individuals that were doing the uh, systems setups within larger hospital communities as well as you know smaller uh, hospital areas and to develop uh, for example a customer service class that was specifically dedicated for those students in the CIS realm to be able to learn how to interact with um, you know a physician or a nurse or the um, or the nurse manager at a, on a particular full floor when there was computer related issues and how the IT support would be able to uh, work with those individuals. So these were some of the uh, strategies and the areas in which we worked at the college. Um, if you wouldn't mind uh, changing the slide, I'd appreciate it. So for me, I had four take home points that I really, um, that jumped out to me. Uh, the first was the connection to students. I think it has been said multiple times uh, a lot of these students um, at Jefferson College, I think we have something like 60% first generation students. We have 70% that are uh, Pell eligible. So um, th these are students that don't have a lot of experience in education. So um, they're coming to us seeking a career opportunity. So our job as educators in, in higher education is to be able to navigate them through those challenging waters. We all know uh, when, you, when you break down the admission process for a student to get into an associate degree program, it, it's daunting for someone who has the support network at home to be able to help them do that. Um, imagine if you're a, you know, you're a, a single mom or a, you know, a, a, a father who's never stepped foot in a higher education institution, you have kids at home, you're now trying to get a new career because your, your previous job has gone away, and this is your first time crossing that, that barrier into a higher education institution. So those, um, those onboarding processes, any time that we could simplify them, the better. Uh, the second point, um, check my notes, make sure I said anything. Uh, I believe I did. Uh, dare to innovate. Um, as we moved in COVID-19, um, by far the easiest program of study for me to transition or for me to assist my program directors to transition was the Rad Tech program. Uh, the Rad Tech program was a Mo Health Wins program. Um, it's developed in eight week um, course offerings. It's very, uh, very focused in its uh, technology use. Um, the faculty members did not skip a beat. Um, and we've, we've challenged with some proctoring uh, of online tests and things such as that. Uh, these two faculty members have been like, oh, it works great. These were some challenges, but, but uh, we, can, uh, we can work through them. Uh, so by far the easiest program to transition. The, uh, the interesting thing, um, as an institution, um, with the ITT closure a few years ago, we, uh, as an institution, um, were one of the only, or one of the first, I'll say that, um, nursing programs to be able to onboard those students and get them through to completion um, within a year of 
the ITT's doors closing. So we had students in St. Louis, we had a group of 12 students in St. Louis that were within eight weeks of graduating from ITT when they closed their doors. Um, so it took us six months to, to, to get them through the process to get them to graduation. And of those, um, of those 12 students, we were able to graduate eight of them and seven of them passed their boards on the first time, um, which we, we were pretty excited about. But the, the point was we were able to work across um, both career and tech education, which is you know, used to being a little more flexible and a little more um, used to changes and arts and science, which um, didn't have that opportunity necessarily to, uh, to, to have these innovative programs. Um, so it was, it was an, it was an interesting opportunity for us to work across the institution to be able to bring not only career training through the nursing program, but also the, uh, general education curriculum to be able to do credit for prior learning and other, uh, opportunities to be able to shorten that pathway to completion. So I, I, the, the focus on core competencies that we, uh, worked through with Mo Health Wins was a really key learning opportunity for us. So daring to innovate means focusing on the, those core competencies that students need to be successful in the field. Uh, the next point I wanted to talk about was collaboration. Um, Marianne uh, spoke of uh, that collaboration um, at the national level, at the local level. Uh, for us, you know, we could talk about um, H2P and um, and uh, going down to Orlando to work with uh, Deb's group and that was an amazing experience and um, I've made uh, I've made friendships and made uh, working collaboration across the country with people I would have never had the opportunity to meet uh, had, were it not for Mo Health Wins which has given us the opportunity to take advantage of some resources um, that are just amazing. Um, Skills Common, um, Merlot, um, all, all of these, uh, all of these resources are, are, are amazing. Um, but when you look at the state level, uh, the ability to work uh, with John and Maggie, um, who are fantastic, by the way, uh, working with John and Maggie, and, and the other community colleges that we never would have had the opportunity to work with and, and develop relationships. And uh, one of the relationships that came out of that was we uh, developed a, a memorandum of, of understanding with St. Charles Community College, which is about an hour and a half away, where we provide in-district tuition to their students that are coming to Jefferson College for rad tech training. And that persists today, where we have a certain number of students that come from the St. Charles area to go back and work in their community. St. Charles, as you, as you guys know, um, Rad Tech is an expensive program to run. And uh, St. Charles now has the benefit of using our uh, Rad Tech program to help educate students from their area um, to be able to return to work in their area without the uh, community college expense. Uh, the next thing with respect to collaboration is the non-credit to credit. Um, at Jefferson College specifically, we had some pretty well-defined silos of what's non-credit and what's credit. And the discussion and collaboration across that didn't really happen prior to Mo Health Wins. Um, now we have, whenever we have um, new programs coming on board or we're talking about the non-credit or credit programs that we're looking at adding, the first thing we do is we bring in um, the non-credit and credit side of the house and we say, okay, how can we build a pathway to connect what someone's doing on the non-credit side to help shorten their pathway on the credit side? And how do we link these two things together? The last point I wanted to make um, was with respect to just outworking the barriers. Um, Maggie said, uh, we have to be flexible in higher education. And um, you know, she's just talking silly talk. We don't do that sort of thing in higher education, do we? Um, but I think the, uh, the flexibility and the work necessary to uh, outwork these challenges uh, requires a certain level of flexibility and a certain level of, of innovation and collaboration. You know, we're, if, we, if we look at our students as individuals, we're asking them to work through some pretty significant barriers. Um, I think we can challenge ourselves as well to work through these barriers to be able to allow our students to be successful in moving on to their careers.
So um, that's all that I had to say. So I believe I'm sending it back to you. Thank you, Kenny, John, and Maggie. It was great to learn more about Mo Health Wins. I want to pass things on now to Donna Meyer from Odin. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to this webinar. First of all, I do want to thank all the other presenters. It's been so interesting. As a past dean at a college, I'm extremely familiar with all of the TAC programs, and you've just presented some amazing work. So thank you so much for that. Um, yes, I'm Donna Meyer. I'm the CEO for the Organization for Associate Degree Nursing. We are an affiliate of the American Association of Community Colleges, and we represent the Community College Associate Degree Nursing programs throughout the country. Specifically, we our membership is the programs and the faculty included. Um, just as a word of advice, you know, word, we also do have a student arm because we do have an honor society for the nursing students. So I do like to. Um, mention that at all times. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but just so that you all have a little bit of understanding, some of you might not be familiar with Odin, um, and um, this just kind of talks a little bit our vision and our strategic priorities that we really focus on um, the education for um, our students, our faculty, advocating at the national level, especially when it comes to HRSA funding, working on leadership for both our faculty, our deans and directors, being very inclusive. Of course, diversity is extremely important. And then collaboration, not only at the local, regional, state, but also at the national level, which I will address um, during the presentation. Next slide. So, Obviously, just like all of you, you were confronted very quickly with COVID. And, um, you know, for Odin being representing the nursing programs, it was very stressful for the faculty, for the students, you know, what can we do? The very first, one of the first things that we did, um, I just wanted to mention is we did put out a call to action because we were so extremely concerned about the PPE equipment. And so some of your schools might have been involved in this initiative because we wanted to try to collect as much PPE equipment, get it to our local community, whether it be a healthcare setting or schools or other places that needed this equipment, long-term care facility excuse me, long-term care facilities. Um, so we really worked on that. So then we were confronted, our uh, faculty, they were very concerned. What can we do? How quickly can we move all of this? So first of all, simulation. Um, we've always done simulation in our programs, but it does present some challenges. First of all, um, according to each state, there's a Nurse Practice Act and the nursing programs do have to follow the rules and regs in those Nurse Practice Acts. Um, additionally, accreditation plays a role in simulation. So that was the first thing that Odin started working on was getting information out on our website about different um, you know, opportunities for simulation. And we also made sure that, you know, people understood what they needed to do. They needed to, you know, make sure they checked with their Nurse Practice Act, make sure they worked with their accrediting body. Um, according to the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, you can do up to 50% simulation in your programs and have the same outcomes. So a lot of our programs had to work with their local boards of their state boards of nursing to say, you know, what can we do? Many boards of nursing across the country have actually changed that you can do more simulation. Uh, so that was one area. So, you know, changing to the online digital classroom, of course, became very important also. And, you know, a lot of the faculty, because it was nursing, had not done a lot of online. So helping faculty move to that online um, venue was very important and needed a lot of help, too. Some of the faculty needed a lot of help, as well as the students. Um, the next thing was we have done a lot of webinars ourselves. We've been partnering with webinars. Um, there's been webinars provided for virtual simulation and distant learning resources, just to try to help our faculty and our students with this work. Um, our next webinar is going to be very interesting, I think on April 28th, because it's going to be about crucial conversations with faculty and students. You can imagine 
that those students that are still going to clinical in some areas of the country and faculty, they do have certain questions. What can, you know, concerns about their own health. And so we've been trying to help them with those. And so our next webinar for Odin is on actually going to be about some of these crucial conversations. Additionally, we have been collaborating with many, many people and organizations, whether it be, you know, different educational companies, you know, and this is all on our landing resource page. Um, those of you that, you know, I would encourage you to go to Odin, www.odin.org, um, because we have a whole landing page on different resources that are available. So if you haven't been able to look at that, I would encourage you to do that. One of the major collaborations that did occur, and it has to do also with a policy brief, which is the next bullet point, is that we worked with um, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. They took the lead, and with 10 other national nursing organizations, a brief came out called U.S. Nursing Leadership Supports Practice Academic Partnerships to Assist the Nursing Workforce During the COVID-19 Crisis. So one of the big concerns, of course, has been getting students back into clinical. Many of the hospitals felt it was just, you know, challenging to have more people coming into the hospital. They didn't want the students there. They could use the help. So what could we do? So this particular policy brief, it was really interesting. We worked on it very hard under the leadership of NCSBN and within 48 hours um, developed this policy brief and basically um, what it says is the proposal is that students in um, the pre art the nursing programs, RPN, um, vocational nursing programs, and that they are enrolled in an approved program by the State Board of Nursing, could actually become employees, um, and that those employed as an employee, then they could also gain um, clinical academic credit. So this was rather a new initiative that we're trying to get those students back in clinical, but also as an employee, then they have some benefits and having a faculty member with them to oversee some of this. So it's rather a unique opportunity that has not been done in the past that could be very beneficial. Um, also working with the media, whether it be social media or working, you know, there's been some, um, an, we were interviewed by New York Times, one of our, um, Dean, deans at Marin College in California talking about all of this. And then again, one of our big roles is advocacy, making sure that we're included in these conversations so that the associate degree programs across this country um, can continue to move forward. Next slide, please. So lessons that have been learned. Some of the things that, you know, I think we're really starting to see is that that simulation might be able to be um, continually bumped up, you know, that, and, you know, what, what can you do? Yes, the study shows 50%, but some of the states are, have only been allowing anywhere from 10 to 25%. So, you know, this, what we're going to learn, I think, is that simulation is a wonderful opportunity and a possibility for nursing students to have more of this in their um, academic setting. Clinical placements, you know, can we be more creative? Of course, we have to start getting out into the community, but could we do things, you know, like the policy brief that students are somewhat employed and also getting academic correct, um, credit? Curriculum, I think you're going to see a big change um, with more integration in our curriculums about population health, disaster planning, you know, things like, um, you know, reacting to this COVID crisis. How do you do this? Um, the next thing I think that's going to become extremely important, and Odin is already starting to work on this, is what I would call health compliance. One of our major partners is Castle Branch, and some of you might be familiar with P Castle Branch because of background checks and things like that. But they are working and have really worked diligently for like the last four weeks and have come up with a software program to help screen students so that they can go back into clinical to show that they don't have temperatures, to make sure that they actually understand proper um, hygiene techniques and that. So this is hopefully will help students get in, back into clinical much quicker as well as the, and this also goes into the quality and safety. 
one of the th initiatives that Odin always has worked on is quality and safety in nursing education. Um, you might be familiar with it called QSIN, but we are really going to focus on quality and safety to make sure that um, the graduates from these programs are working in that vein. And, you know, finally, I really want to mention the nursing workforce. As you all probably know, nursing, the profession, is the largest healthcare profession in the country. But we have to continue to have this nursing workforce. And I think at any, you know, this really shows how strong the associate degree programs are in this country, how important they are to the healthcare of our country. You know, we have many, many rural states and you know where there might be only you know one university and seven community colleges we always have served a very important role in healthcare, and i think this crisis is only showing that how important we are for the nursing workforce and we have to continue to work to get these students out i can tell you one of the big initiatives with the deans and directors in the programs right now is to make sure that those graduates for um, may are going to be able to get out into the working workforce as soon as possible. Some of the states have also, um, you know, changed some of the policies as far as how quickly they can get that nursing license because we know we need that workforce. So, so much is being done. Yes, we have had so many challenges, but I think the way we're looking at it is these challenges are now providing opportunities, opportunities to show what different ways you can do do things in education, especially in nursing, when it comes, you know, to the fact that it is hands on, but you can also do other things and to make sure that we get that nursing workforce, you know, out there and that the associate degree really plays a very important role and that we must collaborate with our other healthcare professions from some of the programs like the TAC grant. So very important. So I want to thank you for um, letting me share a little bit about what Odin's doing. And I do encourage you to go to our website for resources. And I'm happy to help in any way I can if you have specific questions about um, nursing. Thank you. Anna, thank you so, so much for sharing all of that great information. We were really grateful for you and for your participation. Um, I want to pass it over to my colleague Iris right now. We've got about 15 more minutes before we need to wrap up. And so uh, Iris has a couple of questions that folks have been asking that she'll direct to the panelists. Thank you, Ivy, and thank you all the panelists. My name is Iris Palmer. I'm a senior advisor here at New America. And I think we can go ahead and get right to the questions. Um, the first one was sent in by someone who's actually a medical assisting faculty member. Um, and this is something that Donna, you've been addressing, but I think we could get a little bit deeper into it. Um, how do, how have you all thought about addressing the requirements for, from external accrediting body, bodies requiring hands-on hours for clinical courses and allied health problem programs, such as vital signs, laboratory classes, phlebotomy, patient care, Etc. And then we've talked about this a little bit already, but I'd love to give um, a little bit of time for maybe Heather, Maria, um, Donna to talk a little bit more in depth about these type, how, how we can make these, um, these types of experiences virtual given the requirements uh, of accrediting and licensure. Well, this is Maria. I'll, I'll, I'll get started, I guess. Um, this is an issue for sure. And uh, trying to um, navigate and, and make sure that you are um, within the requirements of those accrediting organizations is, it can be difficult. But um, with tools like the Nanzo Lab that we talked about, um, and being able to um, use simulations, some which are built online, and some of those simulations are available um, through these projects and on Skills Commons. Um, it, it's possible to uh, be able to build those hours toward the requirements. Um, I'll be quiet for a few minutes and let's let Marianne or Heather chip in. I appreciate that, Maria. This is Iris, and I just want to say we will be gathering a bunch of resources that Maria and others on the, uh, on the panelists recommend um, to share with the people who have participated in this webinar. Um, looks like, Marianne, you have some comment? Yes, um, I was just on a conference call yesterday with HPN, 
And the person from medical, representative medical assisting and uh, said that Marib and another one of the organizations were relaxing that requirement. So you might want to ch check into that to see what it was. I know that it, like the, 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 hour, the um, unpaid hour requirement was going to be able to be met in other ways, considering the crisis. And then, as I said, this could be an opportunity for some flexibility also in the future. Don or Heather, did you have anything to add on that one? Um, this is Donna. I was just going to say one of the things, and again, I, I'm speaking specifically to nursing, um, you know, the talking to your creditor and really talking to the, you know, the board of nursing is the best solution. I have found that they are very, you know, they understand the crisis and they're trying to adapt and, you know, look at things so that, you know, people can get through their programs and meet the, the outcomes. Um, so I think the best advice, you know, Odin is saying is have those conversations and see what you can do, but, you know, um, with your accreditor and your particular state board of nursing. Thank you, Donna. And I, um, Heather, did you have something to add? No, I was just going to say, I think uh, it's been covered. Thank you. Great. And like I said, we'll be providing additional resources after the end of this, of, of this particular webinar. Um, so we have kind of a technical question for H2P. Um, the medical assistant uh, program that you listed in your in your uh, in your project was it an admin MAA or a clinical CMA program? It was um, both. I mean, it was a, it was a Merb um, one year program for AA, with AAMA and and. Um, CMA accreditation at the end. That's really helpful, Marianne. Thank you. Um, and actually, uh, there was also some requests for additional links from you with some of the things that you talked about. And so um, once again, we'll be providing additional resources at the end of this webinar. Sure. Um, so my, our next question actually is for Kenny. Um, you mentioned an, uh, an integrative biology class. Um, is there additional information that you can provide about that, or is that something that we would also provide as a reference at the end of this webinar? So I believe the integrative biology class was Mary Ann that discussed that. Um, when we talked about biology from the ITT perspective, it was more along the lines of using certain internal and external uh, assessment tools to be able to provide credit for prior learning for individuals in the AP uh, arena. So Mary and I believe you guys talked about the um, integrative biology or was I mistaken there? Yes, um, you are correct. It is an integrated biology course. This course was actually developed in response to the faculty at Cincinnati State's concern that so many students, especially um, our more academically stressed students were failing out of the, the anatomy and physiology sequence, over 50%, which is unacceptable. So what we developed is this course that actually, um, it, it, it does not increase time to completion. In fact, it decreased time to completion because as a result of the challenges with the anatomy and physiology. There was a biology prerequisite, a chemistry prerequisite, and a math prerequisite that were actually integrated into this one six credit hour course, which included also in addition to the basic skills they needed to be successful in a and also workforce uh, types of employability skills, um, scientific research methodology in a, in a entry level way. So using scientific method in your decision making, critical thinking, et cetera. And um, we tested it over a three year period and there was, uh, we went from about a 50% to an 80% pass rate in that course. Um, and the letter grades increased by one whole 
letter grade for those who took this course versus those who took the traditional um, sequence of course. So that's the kind of you know work we were doing with the grant and this course has continued to be offered and as I said, has been um, offered to many other community colleges. And I can, get, I can give you that information, uh, actually how to access information, more information about the course itself. But the uh, rudiments of it are on the uh, Merlot site or the, um, the skills, common, skills common site, yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll, like I said, be sending the specific links to things like that. Yeah. We'll be bringing them together and putting them on the, on yeah, the and, and page. The, and, and the initial data, I think this hasn't been updated, but the data we had through 2016, um, we do have updated data now, is on that. Great. Um, also. Sounds like a wonderful project. So I think what's going to be our last question is for Donna. Donna, how are schools providing exams during the shutdown? Um, exams, did you say? Yes, exams. Yeah, most of them are doing, um, you know, online exams and they're using some type of a security system um, to be able to, you know, um, have the exams to continue. Most of them are doing, you know, something like, yeah, that's what they're doing. <laughs> Just to add on that a little bit more, um, Kenny, I know you have been um, doing something that was uh, very interesting around making sure that students had the technology to take proctored exams. Did you want to share that? Um, are you talking about my shuttling services? Yes, I am. <laughs> we, uh, for our, for our uh, bi-level nursing program, we have, uh, uh, we, we really didn't have an institution-wide proctoring service that we were able to turn to. So we had to develop this on the fly. So we are using, and I'm not, you know, any, any particular product, but we're using the Respondus uh, Monitor program. We'd already used Respondus Lockdown, so it was an easy move for us to go to Respondus Monitor. But what we needed to do was ensure that the individual student had the technology services that they, that they need. So we, uh, at our first group meeting to prepare for this webinar, I actually was on the road delivering laptops to students with my mask and gloves on to uh, ensure that we, our nursing students had the technology necessary to be able to take their um, course exams and um, be able to prepare for graduation. I, I, would, I would add one point on the, on the previous question with respect to um, the, uh, the, the one size fits all. There, there is no one size fits all um, approach to bringing these programs back online. Um, uh, Marianne mentioned early NN2. Um, I, I received a, an email yesterday from a, a colleague at NN2 about how we were bringing our programs back online. And the, the point was each accrediting body is providing different guidance. They're all being very flexible, but they're all providing different guidance. So there is no one size fits all. So with respect to our testing and our assessment processes, each program has had to look at their situation and the alterations that were made by their accrediting body to be able to develop a solution that worked for them. So, so yes, as associate dean, I get to uh, cut masks out uh, for sewing and I get to deliver laptops. So it, um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. It is, a, it is a testament to how much you care about your student success. Um, Marianne, did you want to add anything on that? Yes, um, just to actually piggyback on what Kenny said is that for any of you that are listening um, that are in community colleges um, working with healthcare programs, whether nursing or allied health or whatever, that the NN2 organization is a great organization to belong to and to network with, to be able to um, give you um, guidance when it comes to some of these critical questions. And if nothing else, to have someone else to cry on their shoulder with as we go through this difficult time. Because sometimes it can be lonely, especially when you're in a leadership position. So I just want to give that little plug. Really appreciate that. Well, that was our last, um, our last question. Um, Ivy, if you'd like to go to the next slide. Here is the contact information for all of our panelists and for Ivy and I. Uh, we hope that you will um, make use of these and contact us if you have any questions. Um, like I said, we will be 
uh, putting um, both a recording of this webinar, the um, PowerPoint deck, so it will have the links in it, and additional resources on our webpage. Um, so those will be there soon. Um, and I want to just thank you all for your um, time and attention. And I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing their wisdom with us. Um, please keep in touch with New America. Here are some ways to do that, both um, through our newsletter, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on YouTube. So thank you all so much for your time. And we really appreciate it.